it's hard to think about. It's impossible to reconcile. And there are no excuses. Here are the worst places of Jack Kennedy. We need to talk about the Kennedy siblings. Episode 17. Welcome to Blood and Business. I'm Bethany. And I'm Cassie. This is part two of Once Upon a Secret, My Hidden Affair with JFK by Mimi Alford. Or as JFK knew her, Mimi Mimi Beardsley. (laughs) To my surprise, the president did remember me. In mid-September 1962, so like a month later, I was firmly back in school, having moved into the sophomore dormitory at Wheaton and started classes. Within a week, I received my first phone call from Michael Carter. Even with all the meetings and the public appearances in his day, President Kennedy was known to average 50 telephone calls a day. <laughs> She's in that weird part of adulthood where her parents are still controlling her life. Like she, oh, her parents are like, you absolutely. have to go back to school. We're paying for it. And she yeah. still feels like she, she has, has to, to listen. say yes. Yeah. But then she's also making adult decisions. Right. For her own life. And yes, it's just that age is just so freaking messy. Gray. He called me in the evening when he knew I would be in my room and presumably when he was alone. There were no phones in our dorm rooms. However, we received calls on a house phone in a closet on the first floor. The president would call that number. The president would call the dorm public number shared by every girl in the freaking building. (laughs) In the crowd. So the, the girl who was in charge of answering the phone, the like RA or something, would yell out the caller's name and then the girl who the phone call was for would just come walking over and answer the phone. The president's Boston pronunciation of Carter sounded more like Carter. (laughs) And that's the name that would be broadcast down the hall. Mimi Beardsley, Michael Carter for you. (laughs) Carter. Amazingly, no one ever recognized his voice. So it's like, oh, he amazingly, is insane, because who would ever but think exactly, the president he, is calling? He's this insane, girl's school. but he's not. He's freaking completely rational and he knows exactly who he is. You know? Yeah. He's like, yeah, no one would ever think that the president is calling this like dormitory at Wheaton College in Connecticut. Yeah. And Gloria Swanson's kid is not with you, Pat Kennedy. That's hilarious. Yes. He had a keen sense of what he could risk, how far he could push his behavior, and at what point he would be legitimately vulnerable or exposed. His survival instincts must have told him that no young woman would suspect that a man named Michael Cotta on a dormitory phone could possibly be the president of the United States. The president would pepper me with a million little questions over the phone as if he had all the time in the world. What were the courses I was taking? Were the teachers good? What was I reading? Were the girls interesting? What did they talk about? What did I have for dinner? It was so like him. In temperament, he was an inexhaustibly, relentlessly curious man. He would poke and prod anyone, from cabinet members to assistants, who could supply him with fresh information, a bit of news. He just gets what he can get from anyone at any time. You can say no, or you can give me... A bit of gossip. (laughs) Evidently, that insatiable curiosity extended to the sophomore class at Wheaton. (laughs) My stories about college life seemed to amuse him. He always listened patiently, was never curt with me, never sounded unengaged. He acted like he had all the time in the world for my stories. When he asked specifically about my social life, I resisted the urge to sound more interesting and make updates with young men that never happened. The truth was, I still didn't have a social life. A couple of blind dates here and there, but nothing that made a lasting impression. What college sophomore could stand a chance against the president? Perhaps he enjoyed talking to me precisely because I was so young and naive. We didn't talk politics or national security or news of the day. I didn't bother him with questions about life in the White House or his plans for the weekend. I simply talked about my life and its simple day-to-day dilemmas. Dealing with a difficult dorm mate or a dull teacher. And he seemed to find some relief in this. When can you come to Washington? The president inevitably asked at the end of each conversation. 
I would pull out my calendar and we would make a date. From there, Dave Powers would handle all of the arrangements. A car service would pick me up at my dorm. This is freaking nuts. A car service from the president himself would pick this chick up at her dorm and drive me three hours to LaGuardia Airport in New York to then fly to D.C. Um, for the weekend. Wait, where is her, where is her school? I was even thinking about how far it was. Connecticut. So she literally has a car service to come pick her up, drop her off at the airport. She takes a flight to D.C. And then they pick her up at the airport. Like this is- And how often a do you know? A lot. It's so, like the lady said on the boat. Yeah. You're, you're going to be 25 mm -hmm. and you're not going to have a life. Yeah. Because, because you're spending spent, it on something that yes, has no, no future. future. Yeah, she's not it's, building lasting relationships. No, and most affairs do not end up where- I would guess that, yeah. And that's the thing but about it's also illicit affairs and, and clandestine meetings and longing stares. Also, it's the uh, Taylor Swift lyric that you quoted last episode that you showed me colors. You know, I can't see with anyone else. It's like because- No college student is going to be freaking- It's not just that. JK. It's also the- Well, I mean, yeah. Okay. The president. The president. All, all, all affairs are- The excitement. The thrilling. Like, secrecy, because yeah. it's illegal. Forbidden. And you can't recreate that in a healthy relationship. Healthy doesn't feel toxic. On the way down, I would catch up on some school reading and stop at a beauty parlor in Rhode Island to have my hair washed and combed out while the car waited. What? When I arrived at LaGuardia, there would be a prepaid ticket waiting for me at the Eastern Airlines shuttle desk. And after landing at National, now Reagan, Airport in Washington, I would be greeted by a driver holding a sign reading Michael Carter. Off we'd go to the White House. I think of this image often, 50 years later, me in the backseat of a black limousine in 1962, catching up on homework, shutting out the fact that I was 19 on my way to the nation's capital for the purpose of hopping into bed with the president. That kind of duality was so like me then, the obedient daughter running through her checklist of things to do, no matter what else was happening around her. I guess I knew a little bit about compartmentalizing too. Only when I was in the limousine on the way to the White House did my thoughts turn to the president. Although I still didn't wear any makeup or lipstick, I'd rehearse an item or two that I wanted to share with the president. The quote, White House fever that had me want to abandon college for a job in Washington had not dissipated. It was simply hidden away, a big secret that I couldn't share with anyone at Wheaton. Oddly, my trips to Washington never raised any suspicion among my friends at school. The college insisted that all girls sign out in a logbook at the front door of the dorm whenever they left campus, indicating where we were going, where we were staying, and when we planned to return. My teachers and the dean of students were so impressed by the White House as my destination that they never questioned where I was going to stay. If anyone asked, I'd tell them I was staying with a girlfriend in Georgetown adding that the White House press office always needed extra help on the weekends. While the part about the White House needing help may have been technically accurate, it wasn't true for me. I rarely visited the press office on my trips there. I spent my time in the residence. And did people see her, like, going in and out? Like, everyone knew. It, it seems like she did not try to hide it at all. On my second date trip to Washington in October 1962, I was greeted on Saturday afternoon by a president who was not his usual ebullient self. He was tense and quiet and preoccupied with dark bags under his eyes, and for the first half hour together, I wondered why I'd been asked to come down to be with him. That night, he was distracted and on the phone constantly. He had a lot on his mind. A few days earlier, on October 1st, after a series of legal challenges that ended in the U.S. Supreme Court, James Meredith had become the first Black student to be admitted to the University of Mississippi. Whoa! When Meredith showed up for class, however, he was physically barred from entering the university by the state's governor and lieutenant governor, forcing President Kennedy to take legal action against the governor and send military personnel to the university to protect Meredith. We talked about in the episode that riots followed in which two people died. But in the end, 
Meredith took his first class at Ole Miss, and the president had demonstrated his resolve on a major social issue that he had been avoiding since his inauguration. As a result, his approval ratings had shot way up. By all rights, he should have been a happy man when I arrived. But what I didn't know at the time was that the president was in the middle of what would become the most dramatic and tense episode of his presidency, the Cuban Missile Crisis. When I left him that Sunday, I didn't hear from him for the next two weeks, which was highly unusual. Oh my gosh, they talked often. A lot. But by October 22nd, the news had broken and I finally understood. This may have been the first time I thought of President Kennedy in historical rather than personal terms. In this moment, he wasn't my lover. He was the man with the nation's security in his hands. That night, I called the White House and the switchboard operators who knew me well by that point put me through to Dave Powers. He was clearly under enormous stress and didn't have time to talk. Quote, None of us knows what's going to happen, Mimi, he said curtly. I'll get back to you closer to the weekend. The next four days passed in slow motion. The Cuban Missile Crisis, as it became known, was all over the news, creating deep concern in some quarters and outright hysteria in others. I must admit that I felt a sense of dread, if not panic, myself, and my admittedly naive response was the belief that if I could only get to Washington, all would be well. It didn't make any rational sense, but I felt that if I could be close to the president and in the building where the decisions were being made, then somehow I would feel safer more secure. I understand that. That's like a sense of control. Yep. The following Friday, Dave Powers called my dorm. I ran to the phone. Come to Washington, he said. Mrs. Kennedy is going to Glenora. I'll send a car. I packed my overnight bag and signed out the next morning. It's not her. It's the fact that Jack wants someone with him at all times. I think that that's even looking back now at his childhood yeah. with Lem and Kick, like he just wanted- He cannot be alone. No. He was not good at being alone because he always had either Joe Jr. at the very beginning. Probably because he was traumatized by being in the hospital alone. Maybe, yeah. For and it was just- So long and and at, a, at such a young age and dealing with traumatic stuff like them shoving pipes up you and like not being able to eat talk any to food, talk to anyone. Yeah, you like, don't know when you're dying. You don't. He was dying. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think that that just like scarred him pretty severely and he never wanted to go back to that place. In order to cope, he had to have some sense of like not nurture, but like humanity. Yeah. Yeah. Which is what I was telling you about the Miley Cyrus um, interview that she just did. What? She talks about being a celebrity and she doesn't like to go on tour because <gasps> I it saw that disconnects her from reality and humanity. And the- she said that if like the majority of my human interactions are watcher or observer and performer or Basically subject the and- audience watching her yeah. live her life, do subject her and observer. So it was like his yeah connection to reality, especially with the lifestyle that he had, not just the morta- mortality, but the, It's again, he is the celebrity and people are watching him live his life. Mm -hmm. So he wants that, like someone who looks at him as a lover. And he didn't have very many of those people back then. So we like found someone who- Yeah, didn't get it. Yeah, did not understand. Reality. Jack telling Lee, Jackie doesn't get it. (laughs) Maybe that's one of the reasons- She doesn't know how fun this is. Why he picked, because Jackie didn't look at him like he was- everything. Right. Not like other people did. Not no. like other girls. No. Other girls were swooning over him and Jackie could match him in intelligence. Yeah. yeah. And Dave Powers is like his freaking yes man. man. Dude, like, Dave Powers, ugh. like he Dave Powers have... saw him like an unrealistic god. Yeah. Like he thought that JFK was Hercules. When I pulled up to the South Portico at the White House, I went directly upstairs as usual. There, Dave and I played the waiting game in the resident's living room, the one next to the president's bedroom, while the president remained in a meeting downstairs with a group of advisors known as XCOM, the Executive Committee of the National Security Council. (laughs) This is crazy. 
They had convened at the White House to deal specifically with the Cuban crisis. The president joined us after a while, but his mind was clearly elsewhere. His expression was grave. Normally, he would have put his presidential duties behind him, had a drink, and done his best to light up the room and put everyone at ease. But not on this night. Even his quips had a half-hearted, funereal tone. At one point, after leaving the room to take another urgent phone call, he came back shaking his head and said to me, I'd rather my children be red than dead. It wasn't a political statement or an attempt at levity. These were the words of a father who adored his children and couldn't bear them being hurt. Later in the evening, he urged Dave and me to eat the now cold supper of roast chicken that had been prepared for us. As we began serving ourselves, Bobby Kennedy called to say he was on his way over. When he arrived, I withdrew to a bedroom so he wouldn't see me. Because Bobby this would is, not approve. Jack, absolutely. He would be Jack is livid. his father, trying to like protect everyone-ish, but also like everyone knows. <sighs> like but she I'll, never, I'll, ever saw Jackie. Never or Bobby. Once. Or Bobby. That's wild. Or Lem. Lem didn't do his bidding for him. He had to get Dave Powers and Kenny O'Donnell and all these other people because Lem was like, you're an idiot. Yeah. And a And he warned, warned Jackie. Jackie. He sleeps around a lot and he's not going to stop once he marries you. Are you okay with that? I think I have the coping skills to deal. As a result, I wasn't a firsthand witness to the exchange between Dave and the president. As reported in Richard Reeves' 1993 biography, President Kennedy, Profile of Power, which perfectly encapsulates Dave's role as first friend. Evidently, as they talked, Bobby was painting a gloomy end times picture of the crisis while Dave just kept on eating. <laughs> oh, so everyone stayed except for she just got a straight up hit. her. Yeah. I thought both of them. Mm -mm. She just, just like, shouldn't let the be brothers there. Talk. Like she just no. should not. She shouldn't be there. She shouldn't be there. It's almost like she, she shouldn't, shouldn't be there. there. Hence the 40-year-old woman being like, listen, kid. Yeah. You shouldn't be here. God, Dave, the president said, the way you're eating up all that chicken and drinking up all my wine, anybody would think it was your last meal. The way Bobby's been talking, I thought it was my last meal, <laughs> Dave said. <laughs> when the president and his brother went back downstairs to yet another XCOM meeting, Dave filled me in on what was going on. The president was confident, much more than Bobby. Who would, who would have guessed that? <laughs> that the crisis could be peacefully resolved. He had just sent a letter to Khrushchev offering an end to the naval quarantine and a promise not to invade Cuba if Khrushchev removed the missiles. Now he was waiting, along with the rest of the world, for the Soviet premier's reply. That I was present at all in the residence on that evening strikes me now as surreal. God knows I didn't belong there. Oh, wow. wow. We're and on the same end page. of the story. That's that's all you need to know. We're all on the same page. And that's it. It all makes sense. <laughs> Glad we see eye to eye. <clears throat> God knows I didn't belong there, but it was intoxicating. At that moment, I would rather have been there than anywhere else on earth. But the Cuban Missile Crisis taxed the poise of even the great compartmentalizer. Although our get-togethers were always quite sexually charged, it wasn't to be on this occasion. Dave and I waited up longer for the president, but his meeting dragged on past 11 o'clock, so I decided to go to bed. I was asleep by the time he finally came upstairs again. He unwound that night by watching Roman Holiday with Dave. It like pisses me off that she's like, I'm so glad I was there. Like, shut up, you don't belong there. Get out. No, she's being honest. That's how she felt. Jackie should have been there. Well, she wasn't. Doesn't that make you mad a little bit? Not really. Something else will make you mad. If it's sad for her. She's like wasting her time. It's so stupid. She doesn't understand she's 19. The next morning I got up early, needing to head back to school. The president was already awake, 
and working the phones as I waved goodbye just before 8 a.m. Oh, so she just stays one night and then goes back? Guess so. Because it takes so long to freaking get there. Yeah, sounds gotta like a waste travel of on a time to me. <laughs> my gosh. Literally, the Taylor Swift lyrics cancels all my plans just in case you call. That's the feeling that I'm like, this poor girl. She's so in it and she's not telling her friends about it. She's not, she's not getting any outside opinion, you know? Yeah. And then she's surrounded by Dave Powers and all these people encouraging it. Yeah. She has no fresh perspective. I know. I was sitting on a train somewhere between Washington and Providence when President Kennedy was told that the Soviets had accepted his terms and agreed to remove their missiles from Cuba. Even in a college dormitory full of 19-year-old women, I can't remember ever talking to my classmates about sex, let alone sex with the president. Sex was a closed subject back then. There was no nudity in movies. Television was chaste and wholesome. Advertising was corny and square by today's coarse standards. Among my crowd, boy crazy as some of us were, the topic of sex was taboo. There was something of a cult back then about maintaining our virginity as long as possible, hopefully until our wedding night. So see, this is the problem. She like has no, she has no education or knowledge or anything about it at all. I hadn't even had the conversation with my mother or my older sister. My family, it's strange to recall now, wasn't paying that much attention to me. They thought of me as a well-behaved young woman who had a coveted summer job at the White House and spent the rest of the year studying at college. I also didn't have the kind of open relationship with my mother in which she expected me to tell her everything or in which I could go to her with intimate problems or questions. There was so much that went unsaid. She still had a teenage boy and girl at home to raise, plus a busy homemaking and social life, It wasn't that she was willfully ignoring me. She simply didn't worry about me. She figured I could take care of myself. If I had wanted to tell anyone, it probably would have been my sister Buffy, who was four years older and working in Philadelphia at the time. I suppose I could have told her immediately after that first encounter with President Kennedy. It would have been an uncomfortable conversation, but I could have broached the subject with her, maybe highlighting that I had lost my virginity, but not revealing to whom specifically. But that was a Pandora's box, one I sensed that, once opened, could never be shut. If I'd told her, she would have hounded me until I told her whom I'd slept with, and then she would have felt compelled to act on that information, which meant she very likely would have told my parents, who would have demanded that I end my internship at the White House. And I didn't want that. So I chose to lock it away and not say a word about it. This is how a secret begins. If the president had been nothing more than a summer fling, keeping my secret among my Wheaton classmates would have been relatively easy. But this wasn't a fling. The relationship continued into the fall and winter, requiring many trips to see the president, which made me self-conscious about any mention of him. I was worried about being in a situation where I might let something slip, so I responded, by retreating into myself and becoming a bit of a loner. So sad. You're going to look back at 25, kid, and you're not going to have a life. Ugh. This yeah. is the problem. That's the problem. I was, it's always, it is never the deed. It is always the shame, the isolation, yep. the darkness that comes after. Mm-hmm. With almost anything. It's, whether you, It's the cancer. It's the secret. I didn't participate in college events or make many friends. I didn't hang around in the smoker, the smoking room in the dorm basement, where girls would relax over cigarettes and gossip. I almost never talked about my life. What could I say that wouldn't feel like a lie? The safest course, I decided, was to remain silent. Because my overriding goal was to protect the presidents and my reputations, I withdrew even from my roommates who had also been classmates at Farmington. I doubt they noticed any drastic change in my personality. I didn't stay in bed all day or pout or sigh dramatically at odd moments. I wasn't terribly distracted in that lovesick way. I was just withdrawn and on guard, and it was a stance that clouded my relationship with friends for years. My relationship with the president, however, maintained its intensity through the winter as he continued to beckon me to the White House and request my presence on presidential trips. Oh, it's rough too because Jack, 
wouldn't have been like that, you know? Like he partook yeah, in stuff like that right. all the time and it didn't make him withdraw. Because he was way too good at compartmentalizing. He didn't understand people's normal capacity to compartmentalize. You know what I mean? Yeah. She had to block off all social experiences and all social activity like all together because she couldn't, she, she didn't feel like she could show up as herself. Jack could be himself and be with Lem, with Jackie, with his kids, with Mimi. Dave Powers, with Mimi. He could be the attorney general's brother at 9 p.m. and then jump in bed with her at 10. Yeah, he had a lot of complex parts of him and was so used to being that way. Like he was Catholic, but he was having affairs. He was comfortable with all parts of himself. Yes. And, it, and, and she was shielding one part of him didn't make him feel like a fraud. Like less of himself. Like right. he couldn't show up in his own life. She felt like she couldn't show up in her own life because in order to do so, she would have to show up as Mimi, the mistress of the her president. Her whole self. Yeah. She couldn't engage with other people without letting the secret slip almost. And he didn't so... understand. He didn't know that people were like that. He just knew how he was. Mm -hmm. And he, the way that he was was so unique and so extreme. And I don't know how much shame Jack had because it's like the different versions of him, there was every part of him, every quote unquote bad or negative part of him, he was okay with in different settings. Does yeah. that make sense? Mm -hmm. Like, and whereas I, Mimi or normal people, when we have something that's super shameful, it's like, we can't let that meld with uh, our Because of, of his opinion. Because he knew that for himself, his affairs were perfectly fine. He just wasn't going to show that to the public because he knew that they couldn't handle that information. He's like, they don't know how okay it is. So their view of me is going to be- Tainted. Yeah, like um, inaccurate if I tell them this because they don't get it. So I'm just not going to tell them, but like their view of me is still accurate because, and he's just managing the details and the perception. So Mimi so didn't know this is how I am and this is how I want to be. She was unsure and unsettled in herself, like the which prevented her from being herself in the world. Right. She didn't know who she was yet. And she could only be one person at a time almost. So it's like in this season of life, she had to be Mimi the mistress of the president. She couldn't be anything else. Anything else. She couldn't be a fun, carefree college student and a sister. Mimi, the the mistress of the president and yeah. a good sister and a good daughter. And but it was like she, her personality could only handle one identity at a time. And at the moment, the identity that she was choosing was something that the core of herself wasn't okay with. Yeah. And I think that that's, the whole it's thing like we've been kick. trying to understand like the whole kick. time. It is. It's like the kick. same oh thing that Keith was saying gosh. in her letters. She was so back and forth, but then we were like, no, she's so fully decided. She's decided. She just hasn't allowed herself. She no. has not forced herself to acknowledge her decision. Her decision. <laughs> also, it, I see the similarities where Kick's core identity was. The Kennedy. Catholic, <laughs> yeah, Kennedy was the Catholic kid. Yeah, she was the quote unquote eldest. The golden girl. The golden girl. Mm -hmm. Joe Senior's favorite. But she was a seven on the inside. And so that was always fighting her perceived identity. Like, I it's just want to like, have fun. I just want to have oh, fun. I just want to have fun. But I think she had fun as a Kennedy. She, she did, yeah. She just also wanted to be these other identities. Yeah. But like, she wanted to try them on like a Halloween costume. Yeah. She wanted to and see she, what it would feel you're like. You're right. Because we had decided still, she would always, she knew she could go back home. She always wanted to circle back. Mm -hmm. She just thought in the meantime, I'm, I'm going to have, have some fun. fun. Mimi always knew. The same thing. So she put her, like she said, she put her emotional maturity and growth on pause while she had her fun and it stunted her so much. It cost her so much time. Mm -hmm. Your life slips away so much faster than you think it will. Mm hmm. And you become someone you didn't ever intend to be. Yeah. And you get to a place where you never intended to go. Yeah. So fast. Your days are be your intentional. years and your years are your life. Not all of these trips were unqualified delights. One in particular sticks out in my mind for its wonderful highs and its devastating lows. In early December the president was scheduled to go on a tour of 11 Western states. Dave Powers called me to see if I could meet up with the entourage in Albuquerque, New Mexico at the tail end of the trip. 
after that, we would go on to Bing Crosby's house in Palm Springs for some much needed R&R. Do you remember what this Bing Crosby trip? Dude, this Bing Crosby trip, I'm glad we covered it and like gave the context because it's not going away. It's coming back again. It's oh, coming back my gosh. again. So he was supposed to be. At- oh my gosh, my mind just shattered. What? Hang on. This is the weekend. The one weekend with Marilyn Monroe at Bing Crosby's house. Straight up. And you believe that now? I'm certain to, but let's see what she says and see how it measures. You know? Yep. That's kind of crazy. So Jack's supposed to be at Frank Sinatra's house. This is the breaking of the helipad and the no longer friends with Sinatra at all. Peter Lawford is banned from... Cuts ties. Hollywood and then kicked out of the Rat Pack. Then confesses that it's really Bobby that um, <laughs> Frank should be mad at. So Frank calls Bobby, chews him out. It was the whole ordeal. Five years of the ice turned up a notch. This is the ice. So instead, he st- he stays at Bing Crosby's house. Which was just add insult to injury. Just replace because Frank Sinatra altogether. They're basically the same person. You know what I mean? The same. I still have trouble. Bing Crosby with is him. just the clean version of Frank. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so from Mimi's perspective, yet again, I would have to sign out from Wheaton and travel to Washington to catch the backup Air Force One with one crucial difference. I was no longer part of the press office. I was on board an official White House plane as a civilian, which, according to oral histories at the Kennedy Library, made at least one unnamed reporter curious about my role. And in retrospect, for very good reason, a college sophomore on the president's plane. She doesn't belong. (laughs) Pierre Salinger, who was as skilled as anyone in the world at deflecting reporters' suspicions, must have smoothed over any concerns because nothing ever came of it. When we got back to Albuquerque, I joined Fiddle on a magnificent horseback ride through the high desert. So literally Fiddle is there too. What's going on? What's ever going on, Jack? Jack's like, let's just party. (laughs) Who cares? Whoever would see. One of the reasons why Jack is so peculiar to me, and Eunice had this a little bit, but his ability to just gather the most random characters. Oh, it's ridiculous. Red Faye with Lem Billings. Yeah. Like this. Jackie comments on this, and this is going to be in our in our mini on Patreon about like the behind the scenes White House stories because she was talking to, I think it was Arthur Schlesinger. I can never say his name. Schlesinger. 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 Something. Anyway, Jack had the most loyal, loyal pack of friends who could not get along at all. They hated each other, and but they were all completely and entirely devoted to Jack and kind of all respected that about each other. So they allowed the passing by. They were like ships passing in the night. But it's just ridiculous. Like even Jackie commented on like, I don't know how he did it. Jack. And how he enjoyed all of their company. Thoroughly. Thoroughly. And I think that that's why he was able to do it because it's genuine. He just but liked to be just, with people. Yeah. And he didn't discriminate really like where you came from, who you were at all. We rode until sunset, after which I returned to the hotel to wait for the president and Dave Powers, and then proceeded to regale them with vivid descriptions of my afternoon as we dined in the president's suite. So I don't think Fiddle was in the president's suite because it seems like she's just with Dave Powers and Jack. So is like Dave Powers sleeping with any of them? Ugh, the worst story, I'll tell you. But I don't think so. It had been a wonderful day and the president seemed genuinely happy. The next day, we headed out to Bing Crosby's house in Palm Springs where a large festive crowd, many from the entertainment industry, <clears throat> minus Frank Sinatra, had gathered to greet President Kennedy. It felt like I'd been admitted into some wonderful secret club. And he, he's literally just parading her around. Like, Jack has no shame. He, in front of Jackie, would be seen leaving a party with some random girl in his arm. Yeah. People are watching he grew him. Up people know. Knowing 
my dad's having all these affairs. I'm invincible, basically. My punishing plate, so what's to complain? There are barely ever any consequences at all. Everyone, swallow your lunch, sit down. Quote, but then the evening turned into a nightmare. Oh my gosh, this little innocent 19 year old sheltered, sheltered yeah. girl. Yeah. Is brought no longer. to Bing Crosby's house with all of the stars of the 1960s Hollywood. With Jack. This is Pat and Peter all over again. The innocent girl, too yeah. sheltered, doesn't yeah. really understand what she's getting herself into. The broken boy who's damaged and hurting and has little regard for others. I'd seen flashes of the president's darker side, which emerged rarely and only when we were among men he knew. Freaking like father, like son. That's when he felt a need to display his power over me. Although my admiration for him remains steadfast to this day, it is the darker aspect of his nature that I find hard to reconcile with all of his admirable qualities. In revealing this side of his personality now, I realize yet another damaging note will be added to the record, but I cannot airbrush or ignore his actions during his darker moments. They remain a stain on my memory. Crosby's house was a modern, sprawling, single-story ranch in the desert, and the party was raucous. Compared to what I'd seen in Washington, this was another planet. Welcome to the Hotel California. <laughs> the actual accuracy of that is disturbing. Disturbing. There was a large group of people, a fast Hollywood crowd, hovering around the president, who was, as always, the center of attention. I was sitting next to him in the living room when a handful of yellow capsules, most likely amyl nitrite, commonly known then as poppers, was offered up by one of the guests. The president asked me if I wanted to try the drug, which stimulated the heart, but also purportedly enhanced sex. I said no, but he just went ahead and popped the capsule and held it under my nose. So he like opened it, so she breathed it in, forced her to take it. The president, with all of his ailments, was accustomed to taking many medications and was reported to rely on amphetamines for energy. But he didn't use the drug himself that evening. I was the guinea pig. Oh my gosh. Within minutes of inhaling the powder, my heart started racing and my hands began to tremble. This was a new sensation and it frightened me. I panicked and ran crying from the room, praying that it would end soon that I wasn't about to have a heart attack. Dave Powers, bless him, ran after me and escorted me into a quiet corner in the back of the house. Oh my gosh, and she's in a house with a bunch of strangers. People who are twice her age and are strangers. She shouldn't be there. She should not be there. That is that is the most, that is traumatic because you feel so unsafe. For sure, yeah. The only person Physically that you thought was unsafe, safe. Yeah, your life is being threatened. Yeah. You're being drugged in a house with a bunch of strangers that are taking drugs. Actual trauma. Trauma. What can you do? You are at least a plane ride away from... Anyone else you know and trust. Any sort of safety. Yeah. Uh, that is why relationships like this are so bad. It's not even... It's not based on respect It's at not all. equal power at all. There's. It's impossible. The power imbalance is... Creates... It's Yeah, it's unovercomable. Yeah. Because he has such the upper hand. I mean, this whole time, he's dictating when she can come visit him. Yep. He's dictating when they can be a couple and when they yeah. can't. He's the one calling her all the time. Where they can be she, seen, who can who they can be seen by. Yeah, she who can calls know. some random person who connects her to Dave Powers, who yeah. then gets to dictate whether or not he gets to, she gets to talk to him. It's and the evening okay. turned in to a nightmare. But it's just exposing what's already there. Yeah, exactly. It, it, she has no power in this yes. relationship. Yep. And even just the power imbalance with how obsessed she is with him and how Jack... Insignificant he is, she is to him. Yeah. As much as he likes being around her and enjoys her company. Yeah. 
it does not, it will not face him if she never speaks to him again. And, and this relationship dictated her whole life. Her whole life. Her whole life revolved around this. And that is why you know thyself. Know thyself. Jack knew he could handle it. And he was perfectly fine taking the risks and doing all the things. Because to him, they were not catastrophic. The, the, the consequences were insignificant. Yes. And for her, they were life altering. She was just too young to understand that yet. And with how immature and emotionally stunted the Kennedys were, they were fairly street smart. Like they understood life mm -hmm. at a really young age. Yeah. They could detect when and where things mattered. And like who was in who was in charge? Who has the power here? They knew that. Well. They also knew. We are Kennedys. We have the power. We need the power. We will have the power. <laughs> so the power is ours. So Kick wasn't going to get herself into a a situation like this, like an abusive power imbalance. She might get on a plane and crash, but okay, ready? No, I know you're not. I didn't spend that night with President Kennedy. Did you just hear that? Mm-hmm. Ah. I think J. Randy Terribrelli has done his research. And this is where our red string crosses each other. This is the night Jack may or may not have been with somebody else whose name started within him. A double M. A dame by the name of, of Marilyn Monroe. Monroe. Literally, you have no idea how much investigating we are going to do. So just tuck this one away. Put it in the back of your mind. Bing Crosby's house. Mimi did not see Jack that night. Okay. Okay. I didn't spend that night with President Kennedy. He was staying in a suite now known as the Kennedy Wing with its own private entrance on one side of the Crosby property. Was he alone? I do not know. For the first and only time since I met him, I was relieved not to see him. Wow. And fell asleep in one of the guest rooms. This wasn't my first dark moment with the president, however. He had been guilty of an even more callous and unforgivable episode at the White House pool during one of our noonday swims at the end of the summer. I don't want to read this. <laughs> Oh, no. Okay. Dave Powers was sitting poolside while the president and I swam lazy circles around each other, splashing playfully. Dave had removed his jacket and loosened his tie in the warm air of the pool, but he was otherwise fully clothed. He was sitting on a towel with his pant legs rolled up and his bare feet dangling in the water. The president swam over and whispered in my ear, Mr. Powers looks a little tense, he said. Would you take care of it? It was a dare, but I knew exactly what he meant. This was a challenge to give Dave Powers oral sex. I don't think the president thought I'd do it, but I'm ashamed to say that I did. It was a pathetic, sordid scene, and it is very hard for me to think about today. Dave was jolly and obedient as I stood in the shallow end of the pool and performed my duties. In the pool. He, sh he knew the power that he had over her because he was testing it right then and there. The president silently watched. Much as I try, I cannot bring back anything, any emotion or thought from that episode that would begin to explain why Without hesitation, I obeyed the president's command. Perhaps I was carried away by the spirit of playfulness I felt around him. Perhaps I was enthralled to his charm and authority. No doubt, some of this had to do with my own insecurity and my need for his approval. A part of it also has to be that the three of us felt close to one another in the way that co-conspirators feel connected to the people they're conspiring with. 
Dave Powers and I were umbilically linked to each other in our devotion to President Kennedy and in the illicit relationship that Dave had played an essential role in fostering. And now, the man who engaged our complete loyalty had gone too far. He had emotionally abused me and debased Dave. For what? To watch me perform for him and to show Dave how much he controlled us? Oh, I just ripped the book. <laughs> I'm like, rip this part out. <laughs> Truly, get okay. rid of that. I was deeply embarrassed afterward and I climbed out of the pool and went to the dressing room. I could hear Dave speak in as stern a tone as I had ever heard him use with his boss. You shouldn't have made her do that, Dave said. I know, I know. I heard the president say. Why didn't he say that prior to? Because Jack knew he had him on a string and he was right. He was the president of the United States and it went to his head. He was a little boy with too much power. Yep. And having too much fun. Yep. He had severed his tether to reality. Mm -hmm. And he was just living in the bubble that he was in was just a bunch of yes men and a Mm -hmm. bunch of people who were obsessed with him. And he just had become delusional. You know? Yeah. Like nothing really had consequences for him. He floated away. So nothing had consequences for anyone else. As long as I know that he knows that it's wrong. Yeah, you're right. And Jackie knew. He was losing touch with reality. Yeah, you're right. With who he was and who other people were and what mattered. Later, a chastened President Kennedy apologized to us both. Wow. As long as I know that he he knows knows that that it's it's wrong. wrong. She was afraid of him losing himself. Mm -hmm. Remember, didn't we talk about that in a KFM that like maybe she was saying more than she was saying in that? Yes. We talked about that because we had two KFMs for Jack and Jackie, right? Because we have one Enneagram talk and then one relationship. Like, did they really love each other? Mm -hmm. It's in the did they really love each other. Okay. Yeah. Because at the end, you tear up. 11 part two. Yes. KFM 11 part two. Okay. Um, Where we, yeah, finally understand... What Jackie was so scared of in the relationship and what that really meant and also like what was going on with. But this gives so much more context to where Jack was and what Jackie was so concerned about and also so sad about. I have a deep well of affection for Dave Powers, who died in 1998 at age 85 after spending three decades as museum curator of the Kennedy Library in Boston. He was one of the most entertaining men I've ever met, and he was nobody's fool. He deftly blended his jovial personality with a serious win-at-all-costs commitment to President Kennedy. Richard W. Stevenson, who wrote Dave's obituary in the New York Times, captured him perfectly with this story. Asked once about the most difficult moment he had faced in politics, he replied with a story about forgetting to bring black shoes to go with Kennedy's blue suit in the Democratic National Convention in 1952, forcing Kennedy to make a televised speech in brown shoes. (laughs) And after it was over, Mr. Powers said later, to help him relax, I said, Mr. Senator, that was a brown shoe crowd if I ever saw one. (laughs) That was the Dave Powers I knew a man so devoted to JFK that he would be crestfallen when his boss had to wear brown shoes with a blue suit for a black and white telecast, (laughs) but then could save the day and his dignity with a witty one-liner. But I also feel sympathy for Dave. I can only imagine some of the distasteful duties he had to carry out at the president's behest because I know what he had to do when those duties involved me. Remember, this is before the whole Bing Crosby thing. So these were just like events in the greater occurrence of their affair. It wasn't like this happened and she stopped seeing him. Was she working at the White House during this or she had already gone back to college? No, I'm pretty sure the, I think she was working at the White House because it says that it was during one of her lunchtime swims. Swims, yeah. Okay, so it's kind of in the beginning-ish, like middle beginning. Mm -hmm, Yeah. Wow. 
One of the more unsettling assignments Dave performed on my behalf occurred a few weeks after I returned to Wheaton in the fall of 1962. I was becoming increasingly worried that I might be pregnant when Michael Carter called. I told him so. I was worried, I said. My period was two weeks late. The president took the news in stride, but he shouldn't have been surprised. I knew nothing about birth control, and he never used protection with me. Either because of his Catholicism or recklessness, I could never be sure. What in the world? An hour later, Dave Powers called the dorm and put me in touch with a woman who had information about a doctor in Newark, New Jersey. Abortion was illegal then, but if you had cash and a connection to a sympathetic doctor, you could obtain one fairly easily. I called the woman, identified myself, and received the name and number of the doctor. Dave must have had someone, at least once removed from him, alert her to expect my call. Any link between President Kennedy and an abortion doctor would have been explosive. Even the docile White House press corps couldn't have averted their eyes from that story. That was pure Dave Powers. He handled the problem immediately and with brute practicality. There was no talk about what I wanted or how I felt or what the medical risks of an abortion might be, which was just as well. Whenever I tried to sit down and take a deep breath and run through my options in my mind, my screen went blank. I didn't have the tools to face my situation rationally, and with no one else to talk to about it, I slipped into a state of high anxiety. In the end, it was a false alarm. I never contacted the doctor in Newark. My period arrived a few days later, and I let the matter drop. Neither Dave nor the president ever brought it up again. So it's like they... no words. No. And I don't know if they were requiring her to do that or... If they were just giving it to her as an option. Because they never followed up. They just was like, if you need this, here you go. But then didn't ever ask her what happened or if it was taken care of. But did she not just say it was a false alarm? Like, wouldn't she have just told them? It didn't seem like it because she said neither Dave nor the president ever brought it up again. And it it sounds like she didn't either, you know? Like they, I was assuming that was after she had told them I'm not pregnant. No, I don't think anyone talked about it at all. So they just assumed she got an abortion? I don't know. These people want to live these lives and not have consequences. Yeah. I hasten to add that for the vast majority of my time with President Kennedy, he was a sweet and thoughtful and generous man. He lifted my spirits whenever I was with him, and I'm fairly sure that nearly everyone in the White House felt the same way. However, he did have his demons, and given the few glimpses I had of his more sinister side, I shudder to think of what other cleanup jobs Dave Powers was asked to do for his boss. Dave seemed like he was too nice a person to feel good about any of these assignments, but if he helped ease the president's mind, I suspect he didn't lose much sleep over his role where the president was involved. I don't believe Dave Powers' first impulse was to distinguish right from wrong. What? The actual crud. The actual crud. Yeah, there's no... I didn't know that was wrong about that. That's just... Those stories, there's no... There's just nothing to say. I don't even... Like, there's nothing to say. Just that's the facts and that's what happened. I had never seen real grief in my relatively short life until I saw the president when he returned to the White House while Mrs. Kennedy recovered for a few more days in the hospital. This is after Patrick died. He invited me upstairs and we sat outside on the balcony in the soft summer evening air. There was a stack of condolence letters on the floor next to his chair and he picked each one up and read it aloud to me. Some were from friends, others from strangers, but they were all heartfelt and deeply moving. Occasionally, tears rolling down his cheeks, he would write something on one of the letters, probably notes for a reply, but mostly he just read them and cried. 
Oh my gosh. I did too. That should have been done with Jackie. That's like processing, you know? Yeah. You do that with the person that you freaking went through it with. Like, what the freaking crud? Why is she there? Why is she there? Speaking of, I'm going to do a mini-sode fully about Mimi and her story because the effect that this secret had on the rest of her life was significant and catastrophic. But it's just a really long story, obviously. And to care about it and to get the whole story, you kind of have to go through all of it. So we're going to do a mini-sode separate from this. This is just her and Jack's experience together. Then Mimi met someone and eight months later got engaged. And Jack was supportive of this relationship. But we'll talk about the whole... Ins and outs of that. What that means. In our mini-sode on Patreon. And all together... Jack and Mimi's affair was about how long? From the summer of 1962 to November 1963. So a A year year and a half. half. Okay. A decent chunk of time. Yeah. Tony, her fiance, gave me an extravagant engagement ring created from two oval sapphires that had been his grandfather's cufflinks surrounded by diamonds from his grandfather's stick pin. The engagement was announced in the New York Times on September 8th, 1963, and along with the obligatory information about schools and lineage, made note of my job in the White House press office. If the president had any misgivings about my engagement, he didn't let on. He gave me an engagement present, two gold and diamond pins shaped like sunbursts. I hid them away, never showing them to Tony or to any of my friends. Later that fall, however, I took them out to show the president what they looked like against a yellow sleeveless dress I had bought on sale in Georgetown. It was the only time I ever wore them. The president also gave me a photograph of himself, the iconic color image of him at the helm of his sailboat. At the White House, Fiddle had been a wizard at faking his signature on photo requests, but he signed this one himself in my presence. To Mimi, he wrote, with warmest regards, and deep appreciation. He was smiling when he gave it to me. Only you and I know what that really means, he said. The president asked me to join him on the road two more times that fall. There was a grand tour of Midwestern and Western states from Minnesota to Nevada in late September, and there was a quick trip to New England where he would be receiving an honorary degree at the University of Maine. On the heels of that second trip, I flew up from Washington to meet him in Boston, where he was headlining a Democratic fundraiser that Saturday night. I invited Wendy to come up from Wheaton and join me in the president's suite at the Sheraton Plaza Hotel before his speech. What? After a typically full day that also included attending the Harvard-Columbia football game in Cambridge and visiting the gravesite of his son at Brookline Cemetery, the president was relaxing on a sofa when I arrived about 6.30. He was fully dressed for the black tie fundraiser in an elegant tuxedo with pointed lapels. Ted Kennedy, then in his second year as a U.S. senator, was in the room as well, enduring some teasing from the president about his tuxedo's less than acheron shawl collar. My most vivid memory from that evening was a moment before Wendy arrived, when the president, once again, tried to show off his power over me in front of other men. I could see that mischievous look come into his eye, the one that appeared when he was about to challenge someone to do something they'd never dream of doing. I braced myself. Mimi, why don't you take care of my baby brother? He said to me in front of Teddy. He could stand a little relaxation. It was Dave Powers in the White House pool all over again. This time, I felt a flash of anger. And for the first time, I stood up to him. You've got to be kidding, I said. Absolutely not, Mr. President. He immediately dropped the subject. For years, I have thought about my response as a kind of turning point in my life. I had been struggling since my engagement about how to end our affair, and here I was, finally asserting myself, finally saying no. It felt good. For much of my life, I thought of this moment as the moment that our relationship truly began to wind down. 
In hindsight, though, I've come to see that our relationship was winding down long before Boston, and it was President Kennedy who had taken the lead. In forcing myself to catalog the times and dates when we were together, I have come to realize that the president and I had stopped being sexual partners at the end of the summer that year. When I was on the five-day trip out west in September, I didn't spend the night with him. When I was in Boston in October, I slept in my own bed at the hotel. It's easy to see how I could have missed this. For one thing, throughout the summer, I had seen the president practically every day. I took it for granted that I was in his life. It's a testament to see how much more I valued being in his presence, being around him, rather than being with him. That it had escaped me, that he no longer needed me for sex. The president was changing the relationship, and I wasn't seeing it. The tragic death of his son in early August and my engagement to Tony three weeks later were crucial signposts. The former must have filled him not only with grief, but with an aggrieved sense of responsibility to his wife and family. Even an irrepressible Don Juan like him might think it unseemly to continue his philandering ways when his family needed him so much. As for my engagement to Tony, It's conceivable that the president felt bad about continuing to sleep with me now that I was formally attached to another man. Whatever the reason, it's clear to me that he was obeying some private code that trumped his reckless desire for sex, at least with me. For the rest of that summer, I continued to see the president every day in the Oval Office and float in and out of his private orbit. I continued to swim in the pool with him. There was no change in our personal regard for each other or in his warmth. But now that I realize he had been shutting down our sexual relationship, I find it pleasing and consoling to see our seamless and unchanged contact as proof that I wasn't just a plaything to him, that he enjoyed my company, and that if he had lived longer, I might have been someone he would want in his life, someone who could work for him after his presidency someone he would regard in a small but meaningful way as a friend. Perhaps I'm flattering myself. Like, what the crud, dude? You were an affair. You were a mistress. And you think that your husband would have wanted you working for your ex-lover? Gee, man. We call ourselves the human race. (laughs) (laughs) We have no further comments for this entire episode. Okay. (laughs) That was that. (laughs) Ready? People just cutting each other left and right, just hurting each other. The last time I saw President Kennedy was in New York City at the Carlisle Hotel. My wedding was scheduled for early January, and in late October, I moved home to New Jersey to deal with my bridal responsibilities, finalizing guest lists, sending out invitations, registering for gifts, and selecting my bridesmaid's dresses. I had been scheduled to take one last trip with the president before my wedding. I vacillated about going, unsure about how I could tell my parents that I had to leave for a few days when I had all of this wedding business to attend to. Quote, Tell them the press office is begging you. Dave suggested, but I didn't need to. Dave called a few days later to say the plans had changed. I was no longer on that trip. Instead, Dave asked if I could be in New York on November 15th, when the president would be in town. He's going to be at the Carlisle Hotel, Dave said, and he really wants to see you. I scheduled a few wedding-related errands in the city on that day and went to the Carlisle about 1 p.m. The Kennedy family owned a sprawling duplex penthouse on the two top floors of the hotel, one of the city's grandest. The penthouse was filled with sunlight and had glorious views of Manhattan, which was a nice distraction for me because, once again, I was stuck in a hotel playing the waiting game. I was about to leave when he arrived and he said he had a wedding present for me. He reached into his pocket and handed me $300. 
go shopping and buy yourself something fantastic, he said. Then come back and show me. $300 was a lot of money back then. I felt vulnerable carrying that much cash as I walked down Madison Avenue and turned east at 60th Street toward Bloomingdale's. I asked a salesperson to point me to the most expensive clothes, which turned out to be on the third floor. Although I loved clothes shopping, I had never done it with the equivalent of a blank check. I'd never paid more than $50 for anything in my life, but I felt obligated to spend every penny of the president's gift. I finally settled on a light gray wool suit with a black velvet collar and a pencil skirt that stopped at my knees. It wasn't a very imaginative purchase, I admit. The president seemed a bit disappointed when I wore the suit back to the Carlisle to show him. I think he wanted me to buy something more daring, not a tailored wool suit, not something that was the definition of conservative. (laughs) He took me in his arms for a long embrace and said, I wish you were coming with me to Texas. And then he added, I'll call you when I get back. I was overcome with a sudden sadness. Remember, Mr. President, I'm getting married. I said. I know that. He said and shrugged. But I'll call you anyway. Then I said goodbye, hopped in a cab, and took the train home to New Jersey. I was a little disappointed that I'd been dropped from the roster but I understood why. Mrs. Kennedy had decided to go to Dallas with her husband. Join us here next week to hear the untold stories from inside JFK's White House. Thank you all for listening to today's episode. If you enjoyed it, please give us a review on Apple, rate us on Spotify, and share Blood and Business with a friend or a sibling. If you'd like to support the show, the best way is to become a patron of Blood and Business. You will get bonus content every month, including a monthly bonus episode, interactive main episodes, and behind the scenes footage. To keep up with us day to day, you can follow us at Blood and Business on Instagram and TikTok. You can find the link for Instagram, TikTok, and Patreon in the show notes below. Thank you so much for the support and we will see you back here next week for your regularly scheduled programming on Blood and Business. He did not He pushed people to people their people limits, but their they limits. were always their limits. Always Lem there. had his limits. Bobby had his limits. And and Jack pushed them both to them. Mimi had her limits. Jack pushed and he liked to be amused. Yeah. According to Charles Bartlett. <laughs> Jackie had her limits. Everybody had her li- their limits and Jack pushed them to the brink. Everyone. Without discrimination. You were around Jack Kennedy, you were going to be going all the way. Wherever that was for you. So stupid. All of it. The whole thing. The whole book. <laughs> so, 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 so. What are you doing, dude? Sad. Don't touch your life, your life away, kid. It's just Step sad that like humans mold. have to be humans. Like, why? Why? That's what I'm asking myself. Why? And I've determined we shouldn't be. Why? Why? <laughs> <laughs> I've determined we shouldn't be. Let's just why? Grow, why? Let's just oh, all why? Collectively decide to grow out of our humanity by the age. Leave it behind. Of Thirty. Just. And you're done. And you're angels, we must be. <laughs> and you're a saint. Okay. Oh my gosh. Truly that we're done talking about it. Done. Over it. It's done. And that's behind us. And sealing that compartmentalization. Compartmentalize in game.